Nintendo's Back for 1989 by looking back to 1985. It's NES Works episode 106. Ah! You see this? Do you know what this is? It's a grenade! It's 1989, and we finally see the first edutainment title for the NES since the days of the console's initial launch in America. Sesame Street 123 isn't a spiritual sequel to Donkey Kong Math, but it might as well be. Nintendo launched the NES with the promise of an educational series of games that would allow the console to double as a learning device, both entertaining and enriching children. That never panned out, though, and it took nearly three years for the console's second educational game to arrive, a task Nintendo deferred to a new licensee, High Tech Expressions. High Tech Expressions had debuted as a PC publisher in 1986, around the same time that the NES went nationwide. Its early games on computers, as on NES, focused on education. Eventually, the company moved away from learning games into more general interest work, landing some strong licensees. Not just licensees from outside media, but also from other video game publishers. That includes Capcom, which gave us High Tech's most infamous creation, the astoundingly wretched PC adaptation if you want to call it that, of Mega Man. Perhaps unsurprisingly, High Tech would not survive to see the 32 and 64-bit eras of console gaming, folding in 1995. I suppose they were one of the many casualties of the multimedia era, as the advent of CD-ROM allowed many publishers to enter the educational, edutainment, young children's space and do a much better job of realizing the sort of creation High Tech attempted to create here with Sesame Street 123. Or rather, that Rare Limited attempted to create? Yes, we once again see Rare settling into its role as the most prolific behind-the-scenes ghost developer for NES in the West, the Tose of Europe. Except with much better graphics and music than Tose usually managed. And in truth, Rare doesn't appear to have created this game internally, instead subcontracting it out to another UK studio called Zippo Games, which had recently been established by the Pickford Brothers. Nevertheless, it looks the part of a rare release. Sesame Street 123 may not offer much in terms of depth or variety, and it struggles to keep even the tiny brains of little kids engaged for more than a few minutes at a time, but it boasts great audio and graphics. 123 presents players with two different modes that revolve around counting numbers, and both look excellent, with big, colorful, and reasonably well-animated renditions of Ernie and Grover. Yes, somehow the Sesame Street counting game fails to include the count, suggesting that someone at Rare or Zippo or High Tech didn't quite understand the assignment. I am the count. They call me the count because I love to count things. Wonderful. I suppose you can't fault the developer for focusing on the zanier and more recognizable marquee characters. It's not like the tiny ROM of this cartridge had room for graphics of more than two Muppets. I assume that explains the paucity of content here as well. Sure, Sesame Street 123 is geared toward small children whose brain capacity is roughly equal to that of a squirrel, but even in the 1980s, those types needed a bit more stimulation and variety to maintain interest in glowing pictures on a TV screen than this cartridge manages to present. Of the two, Astro Grover is the least visually stimulating. It involves counting aliens who slowly beam out of a spaceship, challenging kids to identify and reproduce a single digit number. Don't worry though, there's no penalty for failure so you don't need to worry about your little ones learning about any harsh realities of existence. They simply get to keep guessing until they finally pick the correct number, coddling rather than educating children. Eventually, once a kid selects enough correct numbers, Grover appears and flies across the screen in a meager attempt at entertainment. To its credit, Astro Grover does present a few different ways to count up aliens. Sometimes it's with UFOs beaming them into sight, and causing homes to materialize into reality from some unknown void. Sometimes it's terrestrial satellite dishes sprinkling the aliens about the sky. But the overall goal remains the same. Count little green men. The most complex of the minigames, Take It Away Zips, provides you with a number, an operator, and a set of aliens, requiring you to provide an additional number that results in a sum equal to the number of aliens you can see. But despite some charming visuals, including a beatifically grinning moon, it's hard to imagine this setup pulling a child's attention for more than just a few minutes. Ernie's magic shapes offers a little more interest, although it doesn't have much of anything to do with mathematics. Here, Ernie conjures shapes of various sizes and colors, and players need to cycle through a selection of similar shapes in order to create a match. 
about the most advanced this ever gets is a test to create simple objects out of individual shape components. But once again, the game imposes no penalty for wrong answers, and you never have to worry about, say, matching the shape attribute but not the color. So it never feels especially challenging. Admittedly, I am a middle-aged man messing with a game for preschoolers, so I am not really the target market here, but I still feel like Sesame Street 123 underestimates its target audience. And once you've seen the same graphics staring you in the face for a while, the novelty wears thin. I feel like Zippo did the best they could within the limitations of the NES, yet I still question just how many children found themselves uplifted and edified by this experience. Although it looks and sounds quite nice, I feel like the exercises and imagery lack sufficient variety to keep hyperactive tykes occupied for more than a few minutes at a time. That's a few minutes of blissful reprieve for exhausted parents, and that is admittedly better than nothing. Clearly the game did well enough for high-tech expressions that they released a follow-up, Sesame Street ABC, later in the year, as well as a 1991 combo title that collected both games into a single cartridge. Still, no count in the counting game. Someone messed up bad. Also this episode, we have another game from Hudson which also reaches back into the early days of the NES, or rather, the Famicom, looking back to their hit Star Force from 1985. Star Soldier is the very definition of yoink. Hudson liked the sales they saw so much when they published Star Force for Famicom that they cheerfully proclaimed, this belongs to us now. Star Soldier is also the very definition of a Japanese phenomenon that didn't translate to the US market. Hudson shooters sold reasonably well here, but nothing like they did back on Famicom. According to its NES box, Star Force sold more than a million units in Japan, a feat the game absolutely did not achieve in America. But even those figures don't fully explain why Hudson would produce its own Samizdat sequel to the game with Star Soldier. Numbers tell an interesting story, but in this case they don't tell the full story. Star Force for Famicom became something of a cultural phenomenon in a way that few other of its contemporaries managed, kicking off a touring competition series called The Caravan while also creating a handful of micro-celebrities in the form of Hudson's masters. Most famously, Toshiyuki Takahashi, who would replace Tom Tom as the protagonist of Wonder Boy when it became Adventure Island. Although Tecmo had created Star Force, not Hudson, nothing about the concept of a vertical shooter specifically belonged to that company. And they didn't own the word Star, either. So, Star Soldier, a game clearly positioned as a follow-up to Star Force, if not quite a direct sequel. A wink that worked every bit as well as a nod, as it were. A shooter that Hudson could call its own. And it's not like Tecmo sat still while Hudson was grooming itself for success, mind you. Star Soldier shipped in Japan in June of 1986, and a few months later Famicom fans received Super Star Force, Jukureki no Himitsu. One of those games would go on to have many sequels, and one would not. Star Soldier became a mainstay of the Hudson lineup well into the Nintendo 64 era whereas Tecmo largely abandoned the concept of vertical shooters in order to focus on sports and core action games. You can't really attribute the difference in fortunes between Star Force and its spin-off to simple timing. Sure, Star Soldier had almost a half-year advantage over Super Star Force at market, but ultimately the former's enduring legacy comes down to the fact that Hudson heavily invested into their game, whereas Tecmo didn't. Hudson expanded its caravan ambitions once Star Soldier arrived, and it sent a small army of masters to travel the country and spread the word of space combat and rapid-fire finger impulses. The company published strategy guides and even videotapes to help sell the series, putting Master Takahashi on camera to show off his blinding button presses and showcase his pro strats. This, I think, better explains why Star Soldier caught on with Japanese audiences more than with American gamers. Not just the additional promotion, but also the involvement of a familiar face to explain the complexities hiding beneath Star Soldier's seemingly simplistic surface. In the US, Star Soldier just kinda showed up in between Super Mario Bros. 2 and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, a seeming relic from an era that had already come to a close. In Japan, it was presented as a nuanced genre work surrounded by a compelling, competitive social element. Bear in mind that Famicom owners did not want for shooters in mid-1986. The console was lousy with them, and they had increasingly pushed the format in new directions, which admittedly didn't always work, see Zuno Senki Galk, but which left the impression that there was more to the game than simple shooting. 
And here's Star Force, arriving in Japan the month after Gradius, yet taking things backward into an arguably simpler space than even Zevius. By contrast, Super Star Force attempted to add even more complexity to its shooting action, integrating a sort of time travel adventure component to spice up the combat. Not Star Soldier, though. It presented players with streamlined single button action and a linear power up system. You fly, you shoot, things explode, and eventually you die. The most complex things about Star Soldier are the fact that sometimes you fly under the structures within each level, depending on how you approach them, and you need to beat the stage bosses within a certain time limit in order to advance to the next stage. Otherwise, though, Star Soldier feels like a throwback to the early 80s. But therein lies its strength. It's a fast-paced, intense shooter that throws wave after wave of enemy at the players, challenging them to simply survive. You can't rely on sub-weapons or smart bombs, only simple power-ups that you collect along the way, which expand your forward gun to fire more bullets in more directions. Star Soldier rewards quick reflexes and a twitchy thumb. The longer you play, however, the more you begin to appreciate the underlying systems at work. The enemy patterns shift dynamically in response to your actions, similar to those of Zevius and compiles Zanuck AI, which would arrive later that year in Japan. The Starbrain boss encounters seem almost geared to result in a loss on your first attempt, which leads to the enemy leader scurrying away and sending you back to the start of the current level in order to try it all over again. So they require specific strategies in order to defeat, and learning to duck beneath the environment in order to avoid enemy attacks, or steering clear of the backgrounds in order not to go into hiding, which prevents you from attacking and therefore from scoring, becomes a crucial consideration. Hudson did a great job of communicating these design elements to Famicom enthusiasts, and Star Soldier became a respectable hit, arguably the biggest shooter of 1986, and, along with Zanuck, formed a crucial link between foundational works like Zevius and the frenzied vertical shooters of the PC Engine and Mega Drive that would lead to the dizzying Donmaku Bullet Hell format. Now, none of this came through in the US, where Star Soldier just sort of showed up at the beginning of 1989, a point at which games had begun to grow considerably more complex. Now, Star Soldier did okay for itself, I had several school friends who owned copies, despite arriving after more advanced works like Xanak and Life Force. There's some appeal in its straightforward design, and its box didn't hurt, presenting an intriguing and atmospheric sci-fi scenario that didn't actually exist in-game. But American publisher Taxan did very little to push Star Soldier beyond a handful of magazine ads. Certainly they put far less effort into it all than Hudson had back in Japan. I suppose we can afford to give Taxan a little slack. After all, they were new to this whole publishing video games in America thing. The company made its debut with Star Soldier, and it would go on to become something of a mainstay on the NES and Game Boy, with a selection of both licensed and original works that stood out on shelves with eye-catching art, compelling properties, and interesting game mechanics. Of course, Taxan wasn't new to video games. The publisher had simply spun off from his Japanese parent corporation, Naxat, operating in America under an Alucard-like alias that just consisted of its dad's name spelled backward. Why Taxan published Star Soldier in the US rather than Hudson, who shipped Bomberman under its own label around the same time, we'll probably never know. But amusingly, the game seems to have done well enough for Taxan that it would pull its own version of Hudson's yoink. Taxan, or rather Naxat, would go on to create its own vertical shooters, which it also promoted via its own competing events in Japan. In fact, it would publish the most impressive shooter on Famicom in the form of Rekka Summer Carnival 92, a game that more or less perfected the Star Soldier concept by focusing entirely on brief, intense score challenges. Which is to say, things that go around are always prone to coming around as well. Now, granted, it didn't help Star Soldier's fortunes in the US much that Nintendo did very little to promote the game in its official magazine, Nintendo Power. Star Soldier appeared in a small packwatch blurb in the magazine's fourth issue, and a cheat code showed up later in 1989. But that was it. On the other hand, the magazine devoted an elaborate two-page spread to Sesame Street 123 in that same issue, showcasing the more impressive graphics and downplaying the repetitive, limited nature of the game. I suppose Nintendo was still determined to trick parents into thinking the NES had some sort of cultural value. Next time on NES Work, Hudson may have blocked out Tecmo from their own creation, but don't worry, that company is hardly down for the count.